Hi guys, this is Mike, and in today's screencast, we're going to be looking at part 6 of our series on syntax searching. We're going to be looking at complex or multi-layer Greek New Testament searches using the Cascadia Greek New Testament syntax. So sit back, relax, and let's go ahead and dive right in. So this is the last of our series on syntax searching, and uh, this is part six of that series. You can take a look at the other five parts in the series link up in the top right hand corner here. But to get started, let's go ahead and hide our home page so we can reveal some syntax queries that I've got built. And we're going to treat this a lot like part five of our syntax uh, series video on Hebrew searching in that I've already got some syntax queries built for particular purposes and we're just going to review how these were built, the process behind building, and a little explanation on why they work uh, and some pitfalls that you might fall into. So the first uh, instance that we have here is an example called attendant circumstance. Now some of you, if you're familiar with Greek, uh, are probably very familiar with this particular rule uh, within the Greek New Testament. And this rule was really pushed forward and, and highlighted really well by Dr. Dan Wallace in his Greek Grammar Beyond the Basics. In fact, I've got his Greek Grammar opened right here to the exact place where he talks about attendant circumstance. In his grammar here, we have the five features of attendant circumstance, and he makes sure to, lay, to, uh, to highlight that this is only in 90% of the instances of attendant circumstance, so this is in no way, shape, or form uh, going to hit all of the instances of attendant circumstance, nor are all of the search results going to be examples of attendant circumstance. This is just saying, hey, this is typically the way these appear. So these five uh, features are the tense of the participle, and once again, attendant circumstance, if you didn't know, is when a participle precedes the verb and then piggybacks on the mood of the main verb. So we'll dig into that here in just a second. So the features are the tense of the participle is usually aorist. The tense of the main verb is usually aorist, and notice we're underlining usually. The mood of the main verb is usually imperative or indicative. The participle will precede the main verb, both in word order and time of event. Attendant circumstance participles occur frequently in narrative literature, infrequently elsewhere. So we can use these five features in order to actually build a syntax query. So we've got that syntax query over here on the right hand side. And I'm going to go ahead and run this search just so you can see an example. And one of the key search hits for this particular uh, search is going to be what Wallace references here from Matthew uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 13. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up here. It's actually open here in the Cascadia syntax graph. And notice what that how this fits the rules. So it says that the tense of the participle is usually aorist. Notice that we have a clause here that's built from two clause functions. We've got an adverbial and we've got a verbal clause function. And within the adverbial, we've got, this is where our participle is going to fit. Notice that we have a participle that's in, it's a verb, and it's in the aorist tense. So that fits the first feature. Second feature, main verb, usually aorist. This verbal clause function has a word attached to it, which serves as our main verb. This is imperative or indicative. Notice that fits uh, feature three. It's also in the aorist tense. So we can, uh, we're fitting all of our features right now. Notice also that the participle will precede the main verb. So the way that this clause or this query is set up, we've got the participle preceding the verb or the main verb of the clause. And notice that these are both bound by a clause. So we're guaranteeing that they're in the same clause and they're going to be related to one another. Now, if we look at our search hit here from Matthew 2.13, we can see how this is built. Notice that we have the clause here. We have the adverb on top and that fits this adverbial clause function over here. Notice we also have an anything operator in between these because the adverb or the, uh, the participle doesn't always immediately precede the verbal idea in the clause. Sometimes things come in between them. So we have this anything option to account for anything in between. But then to the right of our clause functions, we have other types of clauses and phrases and all kinds of other you know indicators but we've accounted and skipped right to the word level if you notice in our 
uh, query, we've got a dotted line in between the clause function and the word. That dotted line stands for what's called matching skips levels. So when we say matching skips levels, we're saying, hey, skip everything in between the clause function and the word level. We don't care what it precedes or what comes in between these. And you can see all this content over here in the, in the uh, phrase analysis that we're skipping over because we don't care. We just want to know that we have an adverbial clause function with a participle in the aorist tense within that adverbial clause function. And then it's the same for the verbal function. We just want to make sure we have an imperative or an indicative within that, uh, and it's in the air if within that verbal clause function. So this uh, query right here is going to find every single clause in the Greek New Testament where attendant circumstance occurs, fitting the five features that Wallace laid out in his Greek grammar. So we can look at a couple of other examples uh, as well. Let's go look at this next one. This is called when uh, pistis, the, the noun pistis, so in the noun form, not in the verbal form, precedes, or sorry, is followed by a genitive. Uh, and what we're going to get into here is the conversation of the subjective versus the objective genitive. And this uh, comes in really big when we talk about the uh, faith uh, when it precedes Jesus Christ or Christ or Jesus. Is that to be interpreted as faith in Jesus or the faith of Jesus? Uh, how do we understand the genitive? So you can see how this is built here. Uh, and we'll go ahead and run this search just so we can take a look at a, a, a couple of case examples. In fact, let's go ahead and look at uh, this one from Romans 3.22 since this is a pretty hot button topic within uh, New Testament scholarship. Notice what we've got here. We've got a, no a nominal phrase that then is comprised of two separate phrases. We've got the first phrase and the second phrase branching off. And in the first phrase, we've got the actual noun, uh, pisteos. And in the second nominal phrase, we have uh, our genitive. Both of these are in the genitive case. However, we are wanting to understand how the second genitive is operating within this particular phrase. Notice if we look at our syntax query, we've got a nominal phrase that then is broke out into two separate phrases. Now notice the great thing about the Cascadia syntax database is that you can search by what's called a head term. So in essence, I'm saying I don't have to build off another level to the right of this to say on the word level, I can just say find every phrase where pistis is the head term or is the main uh, word within that phrase. And that's gonna be the ones that we're really interested in. And then the same thing in the second phrase, find where the head word is uh, either an adjective, a noun, a verb, and all of those are in the genitive format. And you can see uh, if I click on this node and go to head term morphology, you can notice you can input multiple morpho morphologies within this one box. So notice I've got a noun in the genitive. You hit a space and type at again. I can do adjective, genitive, at, and then verb in the genitive. And this is looking for participles in particular. So, that, so you can enter in multiple terms. One other thing that you can do, if you notice, this box for pistis is highlighted in orange. This actually means uh, I'm telling Logos to highlight this particular search result in my searches. And you can turn this on by simply right-clicking on the box and selecting highlight this term in results. And if we look at our search results, notice that the noun pistis is highlighted in red in all of the search results because I told Logos to highlight that particular thing uh, for me. So this is finding all of the places where pistis precedes another genitive in the same phrase. And this will find all of the instances that we're going to be interested in where we can look at objective and subjective genitives uh, to help us in determining how should we interpret Romans 3.22. Should it be faith, the faithfulness of Jesus Christ or should it be faith in Jesus Christ? And you can read more about subjective and objective genitives uh, if you look at Wallace's grammar. And then last but not least, let's go ahead and look at one other one that I wanted to highlight for you. And that is this one where uh, henna serves as a postpositive. If you don't know what a postpositive is, a postpositive is basically when a conjunction or a word uh, doesn't appear first in the clause. So typical behavior of henna in, in a henna clause is that henna is the first word within the clause. That's its typical position. However, sometimes it's postpositive and appears as not the first word in the clause. So in essence, what I'm looking for are all the other places where henna is not the first word of the clause. 
uh, but it's still serving that role of conjunction. So if we go ahead and run this search, and take a look at this real quick, and let's go ahead and I'm going to scroll down and look at Galatians 2.10 uh, for example. And notice what we have here. We've got a clause where henna is buried right in the middle of the clause. So we want to find other instances where we have a clause, but henna is not at the beginning of the clause. In fact, it's buried somewhere in the middle of the clause. So what this is saying in this query is find every clause, and then we've got a not uh, option here. And the not option is saying where henna appears, or where henna does not appear as the first word. So the way that you can turn this not on is if I click on this node and look at the general, I can set a couple of things. First, I can say match context where this term is present or is not present. Every time it defaults to is present, so I turn that on to is not present, as well as you can select where you want it to appear. Notice you've got appears anywhere, appears at the beginning, at the end, or is the only child. I set this one to be at the beginning. So that will mark it as the first word in the clause. So I'm looking for every clause where henna does not appear first. However, henna does appear in the clause. And I've got this marked by another terminal node um, with henna as the lemma of that terminal node. And notice I've got this highlighted in orange. So I want it to mark it in my search results. So those are a few examples of complex multi-layer or multi-level syntax queries that you can build. Now, obviously, this is not an exhaustive tutorial in building multi-level syntax queries within the Greek, Greek New Testament because this video would be way too long. And in fact, it's already too long uh, already. But I wanted to give you a taste of some of the different methods or some of the different ways that you can build syntax queries uh, to help find complex clausal structures. So if you found this video helpful, make sure that you give it a thumbs up. And if you want to see other videos of this type and variety, make sure that you hit the subscribe button here. As always, enjoy mining the depths of the scriptures using logos. Until next time.